you know, it's hard to talk about this house objectively, about being here, because it was a feeling place. You just came and you were quiet. It was, it was never a noisy place for us, ever. There were, and I don't remember ever any arguments up here. It just, this is a really special place. It just was a place that we came to. We would load up stuff in the car, you know, fresh water. And, and you know, we just built the fire in the fireplace and hung out. It was just to get away. You know, coming from the city, and especially you no know, freeway, you know, it took forever to get here. And it was hot and it was noisy, and you'd suddenly start cooling off and cooling off, and then you just sort of, yeah. This was a, this was a haven. It starts with the heck of the drive and the planning and the, and the scheming to get up here. Um, we would stay in the cabin over here and so we would bring our pillows and we would bring our blankets and we would bring uh, all of our warm clothes, every piece of warm clothes we ever had. Um, we would bring water, we would bring food. I'm sure my parents brought alcohol. I don't remember that, but uh, sure they had a nice time up here. And then we would drive for forever from Kahala to get here. We see from the outside that there's this rustic cabin. We come in the door and it continues to be rustic the whole way. Everything open air and we're right smack dab on the edge of the most beautiful cliff you've ever seen. With the valley just spilling out down below. And we're not familiar with this side of the island, and nobody that we knew ever got this view from this vantage point. <sighs> we would take a lot of delight when, when we didn't have mosquitoes, um, and just leaving all the doors wide open, and, and just being indoor outdoor. It just doesn't get better than this. Doesn't get better than that, right? When you come up here, you're, you might enjoy the house, but you're here to enjoy the mountain, to see the view, to feel the air.
in the late 40s and 50s, a number of these cabins were established because there were areas that had been prepared by whatever the military was doing and that were now vacant. Um, you know, a hundred years ago, you would have come up here on a horse, right? But during the war, you'd come up here in a car, and after the war, the road remained. So uh, it made it more accessible, and it made it possible for this cabin and other similar cabins in the area to be constructed. Vladimir Osipov acquired the lease for this piece of land in 1949 from the Campbell Estate. Osipov was born in Russia in 1907, but was raised in Tokyo, Japan until the age of 16. In those formative years, you can take two things away that would be reoccurring themes in his life and architecture for years to come. The first was that he was a Boy Scout during his years in Japan, and through excursions and hikes, gained a deep respect for nature. So finding a weekend spot for him and his family where they can be immersed in nature and be up in the mountains with access to hikes and trails and feel the elements and watch the weather change it makes a lot of sense. The second is that the Japanese residential architecture he grew up in made a lasting impact on how he designed. From the spaces to the elements, the construction techniques, and the overall aesthetic and proportions of his domestic spaces. When Osipov came to design and build a cabin up here for his private use, not for any clients or anyone else, you can see him exploring and expressing his architectural beginnings. When you come here, you can see the essence of what his style was, because that's all that's here. There's nothing fancy. There's just the unique sense of design and how it fits together with the minimal amount of detail or, you know, the, the fancy little decorations. For me, just a feeling of comfort and, and belonging in an Osipov house, including this house, which is quite different because it's not built to the same scale as any of the other houses I've been in. Usually they have a steeper roof line and uh, they have a beam going across the way this one does, but the beams are significant, big beams, and this is little. Everything here is done in miniature. I always felt like I was coming to a little dollhouse. You know, loved it up here because everything was so manageable. I knew when I went to other people's houses that weren't respectful of space design because everything was sort of chop suey or overcrowded or not dimensions that were pleasing to the human spirit. I could tell because the roofs were low and there was no grace in the ceiling and there was no overhang in the eaves and the gutters weren't made of copper. <laughs> I mean, not that I was noticing these things as a child, but I knew. I could just feel it. And then when I would go into a house that had this kind of grace, I could feel that. My sister's line was my favorite line about my father's architecture. You see, you go into one of these houses and it wraps his arms around you. And it feels that way. You come in here and you're comfortable. And that's, I don't know how he did it, but it, it, I was never in a house that he did that didn't feel that way. Even the fancy, fancy ones, you know, with a lot of concrete and glass, still felt that way. In my lifetime, I lived in one, two, three, four houses that he designed. So you get to a sense of what he does and how, how livable it is and how comfortable it is and how human it is. Um, and then you sort of, sometimes I would think, how come that works? And then, you know, do measurements and say, oh, okay, it's a rep repetitive sort of something. But it was, it was just, I was a kid, you know?
Now, you did some work yourself over here. You told me before that your father would give you a hammer or a saw and you would actually participate wow. in some of the construction. Well, we would have races to see yeah. who could saw a straight line faster, you know. Yeah. Did, you, did you ever win? Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Val put us to work, and I can't remember what I did. I probably did the sweeping, but Brother Kurt was conscripted to do some very serious yard work. And Val would, but I have to say, Val, Val was a very good delegator, and he was a very good um, um, director, <laughs> uh, but he did a lot of work himself. When Kurt wasn't here, Val would go over the edge of that cliff himself. We have pictures of him with a rope tied around him, no shirt, just his shorts and his shoes, over the edge because he wanted the view plane to be presentable, and he didn't want all the tall trees growing up. Most of the guys from the office would come up and would have weekend building parties. Now, is this something they wanted to do or something I that your father no sort of... I have no idea. <laughs> you know, Hasipov, he had a way, you know. He said, come on, guys, we're going to go up here for the weekend. You don't say no. Yeah. <laughs> so, As I said, I was not intimidated by Val, but we kind of did things his way. We ate when he was ready, <laughs> and we played tennis when he was ready, and we went on the hike when he told us, and he'd say, we're going to leave at such and such a time, and by golly, we'd be ready right then. <laughs> Do you remember him doing any work while he was up here? I remember him doing nothing but work while he was up here. Oh. Except, you know, we'll see where his drafting table was, right. and he would do draft work, office work, too, when he yes. was here. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had a little stool, a drafting stool, and he would sit here, and this is where he worked on the weekends. He would draft. And I love this, this little sliver of a view. It's really wonderful. There's very little information on Osipov's initial thoughts behind the cabin, or what exactly his design intent was, why he chose to make certain spaces in that way. But from the few sketches and drawings that we do have, we can see that he had a focus on detail, craftsmanship, and using these Japanese elements like the shoji, the tatami, the angawa off the back, and even the genkan at the front. Because this house was meant only for him and his family, it's unrefined, left unfinished, it's raw, primitive, and honest. Instead of a polished oil painting like the buildings he's usually known for, this is his sketchbook, a window into his mind. And in typical Ospov fashion, it's also a reflection of everyday life, and he experiments with clever details that enable better environmental living. This is a favorite little feature. And we, we know that Asipov actually drew this design because the, the blueprints, some of the blueprints from this house, are still on file at the University of Hawaii. Um, it's a little pull-out hidden broom closet, and you can, you can use it halfway. So, I understand that there used to be an ofuro here, a, a wooden rectangular box for Japanese-style hot soaking. Um, if you were in an ofuro, you'd be soaking about here, and you get a nice view out the window. And this is a fun little little feature here, how, how the storm doors stack into this. You slide them all down and you just shove them into the pocket and then all the storm doors can just 
disappeared. And you said you used to sleep here. I just was laying down and I fit still. You still fit? I do. I want to see that. I fit. Pardon my shoes. Oh, really? It looks like you belong. This is home. How about that? This is my bed. That, that bed is measured exactly to one Valerie. <laughs> That's my bed. You know, I grew up pouring cement and building walls and hammering nails and, and stuff. And that's, that's why I don't know how to do anything else. You know, I don't know how to surf or ride a skateboard because my formative years as a teenager, I was pouring cement and cutting bamboo jungle down and hammering a house together. Um, so, you know, it just as a matter of serendipity, my family came into possession of this. And um, at the time, uh, the resident here was a, a retired uh, university professor and he was aging in place and he had done what he could to maintain it, but it was cluttered, <laughs> very cluttered. Um, and uh, when he finally moved out and, and retired to a, a retirement home, we had full possession of this. And the, show, the fabric on the shoji doors was torn. So the first thing we did was just empty the house out to its bones, basically. Just get it so we could see it. And then fortunately, uh, we had some photographs that the Goodsell family provided to us to, of the times that they had spent up here in the mid-60s. So we, we had an indication of what was here at that time. It was mostly just the, the, the bringing out of the detail, um, the sanding down and the polishing of the natural wood finish and uh, the restoration of the shoji and uh, the sourcing of the seagrass mats uh, to bring them back and then finding you know furniture which is as best as we could replicate uh, what was showing in the pictures um, so it was a, a five-year quest wow is this like you remember oh they've done such a nice job Oh, it is so nice to be back here. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> this spruce log sitting here um, was something that I knew I wanted to preserve. This is the same log since 19... 50 probably has been here. The spruce on the mountain was planted at the turn of the century or in the last century in the late 1800s. And much of it is just dying now. It's just end of life. People were, it was planted before all the eucalyptus and everything went in. So I'm looking around to see where I can find a log that will replace this one because this one's just been so bug eaten and termites and boring wood beetles and rot. And it was the last thing we did. I, I, ha I have to preserve this iconic bench. And I picked it up thinking, oh, I'm just going to whip it off the cliff, <laughs> right? <laughs> because it's gone, right? I'm going to bury it off the cliff and find a new one. But it was still heavy. And I'm like, okay, maybe Jane can sit here and it won't fall in half, right? It won't break in half. It's still, it's still strong enough, enough right? So I decided we just, we scrubbed it all down, got the rod off of it, and then I, I, I just soaked it in a gallon of surfboard resin. And I'm defying any bug that's in it to find its way out. 
and any bug that's on the outside to try and find its way in. Up here, we would mostly come as family or very close friends. And uh, like the Goodsills, who are very close friends of ours, and we, they love to come up here. And that's when this got built, so that friends could come and have a place to stay, you know, without being all crowded in here. So there's one other part of this story I want to tell. When the day was over, We'd be exhausted because we'd had to have done a lot in this day. So then we go up to bed, and the good seals tromp up the little pathway. We open the shoji doors and the tommy mat on the floor, and nothing else. Oh, okay, we're going to sleep here. Yes, my mother said we're going to sleep here. We're going to set the beds just like this, and everybody will have a pillow, and everybody will have a blanket, and all the good seals, all six of us, are in one room. <laughs> Every hour of every day, it's a different painting. Yeah. When the sun gets low and the ridges light up with direct side light, you can sit here and just look at a different artist's interpretation of this landscape. Val loved it up here, and Val was a nature guy. He loved to camp, he loved to hike, he loved to be in nature. So if he could be outdoor, indoor at the same time, that was heaven to him. So this was his play area, and you know, the guy worked hard and uh, had demanding clients and was demanding himself of his workers. So that if he got to come up to have a place where he could just be, I think that was a significant thing in his life. And he was happy up here. I think that's, that's a big part of what my family is trying to do up here, um, which is so important, uh, the way we grew up, and you know, the deep respect for the, the natural environment, um, preserving and protecting the unique part of Hawaii that you find nowhere else on the planet. And so when you come here, we want to share that. That is what transforms people's lives. When you come and you, you see this, the sunset and the reflection on the mountains and you can identify the birds and the native plants that have been here for millions of years, you get a, a sense of respect for that. If you learn about it, then hopefully you get motivated to protect it. And that's really what this is all about. This is, this is the icing here. The, the, this cabin has a story to it from a, a famous architect. But if you get to the core of it, that's what he was getting to as well. He was getting to a place that reflected and invited in nature, that respected the winds and the rains and the trees and the wildlife. And so hopefully when people come up here, it's not just a vacation, it's not just to decompress, it's not just to get away from whatever their urban strife is, but it's to 
gain an understanding of what is here and how precious it is and how it needs our time and attention to protect it. That's what I hope people get.